leads us right away to our next speaker, to Fritz Haag, whose CV reads like a piece by Georges Perec. Uh, his work includes edible gardens, public dances, educational environments, animal architecture, domestic gatherings, urban parades, temporary encampments, documentary videos, publications, exhibitions, websites, and occasionally buildings for people. Recent projects of Fritz Haag include Sundown Schoolhouse, Edible Estates, or Animal Estates, and we are very, very happy uh, to welcome Fritz here in London. He had contributed to the Manifesto Marathon some years ago, and we talked today about the garden. Um, in 2008, he actually showed at the Whitney, that was the beginning of Animal Estates, and his kind of current or upcoming projects include a big project in Istanbul with salt, in Den Haag with Strom, and also a project in London, Arub Phase 2. The title of Fritz's contribution today is How a Garden Can Change Your Life. He will give a short introductory overview over the discovery of gardening in the city and the importance of allotments and how it actually changes our life and work. Hag's presentation will then be followed by an interview with uh, Bookwork Council Housing Estate resident Denise Withers, whose life was changed through her pivotal involvement in the cultivation of Edible Estate 4, which is a project of Fritz Haig in London, which was commissioned by Tate Modern in 2007. A very, very warm welcome to Fritz Haig. Um, am I on yet? Can you hear me? Are you jealous of my sweater? <laughs> I was prepared. People thought I was crazy today putting on this sweater, but. Um, my gardening obsession came over me like a fever in 1999. I had moved from New York to Los Angeles looking for some adventure, a fresh start, a bit of freedom, something wild, and a deeper connection to the outdoors. I arrived to town where I had just three friends, no job, no prospects, and $10,000 of debt. But out my door was a big enclosed patch of unkept weedy soil where I soon began to spend all of my time establishing my first garden. I went deeper into debt each day, buying seeds, plants, soil, compost, pots, and gardening books that eventually surrounded my bed as I would drift to sleep each night dreaming of possibilities for that dirt out my door. The pragmatist in me argued that this was madness, a waste of time. But I surrendered to it completely, feeling a sense of urgency that somehow it was the only thing that really mattered, that it was what I had come here for. It was the only time I felt like I was exactly where I was supposed to be. Outside with my hands in dirt, time fell away. And indeed, much of my future work would grow directly out of those first few months of gardening mania. The following year, I bought a hilly piece of wild land with a geodesic dome in the hills nearby, where I gradually created a more ambitious garden that became a laboratory for my work and site for gatherings, events, and performances. As I began to teach in local art colleges, I would develop my classes around principles of gardening. Schools had computer labs, so I created garden labs in response, establishing scrappy community gardens with my students on the campus lawns of Art Center in Pasadena and CalArts in Valencia. Then, in 2004, George W. Bush was reelected. The United States, yes, this is part of the story. The United States became blue states versus red states. Having always lived in the blue and feeling a growing disillusionment with the insular dialogue within the contemporary art and design communities, I responded with the plan to take my work to the middle, to the red. The first edible estate garden was established in Salina, Kansas, the geographic center of the United States, on Independence Day, July 4th, 2005, and commissioned by the Salina Art Center. I found a local family of eager gardeners willing to surrender their front lawn. I developed this design, and over a long weekend, we ripped up the lawn and planted everything we could find that would produce food in that growing zone. I left town, and the garden was theirs to continue on their own terms. The series of regional prototype gardens has continued since, planting one or two gardens a year, each in a different city and climate for a different family and neighborhood, demonstrating the possibility for publicly growing food in the cities where we live. They are cheap and simple, with no expensive materials or fussy designs. Anyone could walk by and imagine doing it themselves, too. Each is planted between the front door of a typical residence and the street. The most critical decisions are where it is and who it's for. Unlikely conditions, unlikely locations are selected. 
where a garden producing food might be surprising, shocking, unwelcome, or even threatening. Even if nobody else in the neighborhood follows suit, everyone is a witness to the garden and what, looks, what it looks like, what food looks like when it is growing on plants that come out of the dirt, which actually is a true novelty in most parts of our cities today. Later additions have been planted on a front lawn in suburban Lakewood, California, around an apartment complex in Austin, Texas, in front of public housing in Manhattan, on my rooftop in Rome, later donated to a community center, in Istanbul in the form of a public gardening headquarters, in a hothouse on top of the new art institution, Salt Beoglu. And in spring 2012, Edible Estates number 12 will be established in Budapest. My professional and academic background is in architecture, my early passion. But buildings are boring to me now. It is only people with money who decide what our buildings will do and how they will look. But anyone can go outside tomorrow and put a plant in the ground and begin to affect the future of their city. Gardens are the easiest first wedge for any urban resident to engage. Gardening as a political act. Gardening as a form of resistance. Gardens go viral. Gardens are people. Watching a garden is witnessing live human intention. When the person goes, so does the garden. I'm not interested in invisibly manicured precious landscapes that we are meant to passively watch like TV. I want urban landscapes that are gardens, that, are show, that show daily evidence of individual human desire and ideas. Everything we need to know about how to live on this planet we can learn from a gardener growing food, like Denise. They are intimately aware of the story of where our sustenance comes from and where our shit goes. I am I'm interested in gardening as a form of communication between one person and the dirt under their feet. Gardening is the ultimate metaphor for a thoughtful human conversation with the world around us. In 2007, Tate Modern commissioned the fourth edible estate garden. We found a site in Southwark at the, cor at the corner of Lancaster and Weber, surrounded by council housing estates with the help of Bankside Open Spaces Trust who would go on to help produce the project and oversee its future. The elaborately curvy design was meant to echo the Royal Palace Gardens like those we find around us here today. And it is, it is designed as a pleasure garden that happens to be productive. Um, Carol, Carol Wright from Bost, Kathy Noble from Tate, and I went door to door to each flat in the Brookwood Housing Estate overlooking the selected green triangle to tell the residents of the plan, gauge their interest, invite them to participate, and hopefully get their approval. Each resident agreed to the plan with varying levels of disinterest, except when we came to flat number seven. Upon knocking the door, the door opened so fast, and the response to the garden was so enthusiastic that it seemed the resident, Denise Withers, had been waiting for us. She was the only, one of the only residents who joined the local crew of volunteers to plant the garden, as she has been the force behind it ever since. She patrols from her third floor balcony, making sure no one messes with it. She has publicly, they call it like the watchdog, she has publicly nurtured it for four and a half years. Every time I'm in town, I stop by to see how it's doing. And sometimes we have a brief chat, but I've never had the chance to formally sit down with her and find out about her experiences. So we're going to do that today with a quick interview. Um, this is Denise Withers. There's the garden. Um, so you can all pretend you're overhearing us hanging out in the garden, and I'm asking questions about what's going on. Um, so Denise, one thing I'm curious about is what immediate public feedback was from people in the neighborhood once the garden had been planted and you were out there. I was amazed that um, when we was first, when they first come and knocked on our door and asked would we like this garden, a lot of people thought it was going to be like an old style allotment where we'd all have our own little square of dirt. They didn't realize that it was going to be such a beautiful, creative garden. And so at first I was a bit skeptical about, like, well, most of the people in my block wanted a car park. Because there's a pub across the street and people were worried that it was going to get trashed. But all it was doing was being as a dog poo ground. Oh, there I am there. <laughs> there um, well, you were telling me a story earlier, which I didn't, um, I hadn't asked you before either, but the big uh, worry with a lot of people with these gardens that I do is they're worried about vegetable thieves. It comes up with every single garden I do because they're all public. So, have there been any vegetable? Yes, um, just a couple of months people? ago, someone, because with this garden, I've got all the sewer flats around. They all protect my garden, and if anything's happening, any pilfering, they come and knock on my door and say, Denise. So, the other day, I've got a knock on the door, and someone says, Someone's walking up the road with your pumpkin. 
<laughs> so out I burst, forgetting that I've got no shoes on. I'm running up the road and had to run after the lady to retrieve my pumpkin. When I've got older, the lady, she's telling me, well, I did come and plant it last year when I know fact that we do gardening with a little school over the road and that the kids from the school planted this pumpkin. But she wanted to fight me over this pumpkin because it was the pumpkin that she grew from last year. But it, but it wasn't planted last year? No, no, the school planted it this summer. Okay. <laughs> so have you had much of that garden thievery, though? Have there been many In vegetables? the beginning, we had loads, but now they seem to have got used to me because I'm a little rockweiler of my garden, and if I find anyone in there, I'm down there in their face like <laughs> this. Um, can you tell me about any previous experience you had with gardening before, before I met you? Because I don't recall I've ever... Asking. I had no experience with gardening. I didn't realise how fast food grew. And um, when I see it growing, it's amazing. It's a bit OCD at first. I kept going around checking and counting how many things and making sure things didn't get robbed in the night. Sorry. Oh, yeah, hold it closer. Um, well, can you describe those first few, few months of of time you were spending in the garden? The first few months of time, I, I was just in shock because every day I come down, there was something new in the garden which just brightened up my life. And I think, well, one of, one of my original dreams for the project was that once the garden was there, the local community would get involved. And because there's no private plots in the garden, there's no um, individual uh, it's not an allotment garden, it's a communal garden. Nice. The dream was a lot of people would be involved, but what, what's been the involvement of, of the um, We have of a couple of residents that come out and in the neighbouring blocks as well, but we get a lot of um, from the school over the road. We have them come in all the time and we teach them how to grow things and they just love seeing that this food comes out the ground covered in dirt and not in a plastic bag. Well, but, and isn't it true that your original, your original work before we met was working with children? Yes, I used to be a play worker years ago, but before you knocked on my door, I used to just sit in my house and do nothing. <laughs> and then, uh, how, what has the involvement with kids been like versus the residents? Because I noticed when we had planning weekend, you know, everyone was, was invited, but you were one of the few adults in the buildings yeah. who, were, who was there, the but kids do it was come, mostly the kids. The kids do come in the lot, garden a lot, even to today. They like watching the um, fruit and vegetables grow, and they especially love eating it all as well. But they do come and knock on my door first and ask, can they come and take it? Um, and I think something that also comes up a lot, especially in a city like London, is people don't really believe you can grow food in the city and eat it. Yeah, they Actually, think it's all, um, it's been polluted by the traffic because there's all roads going around. But everything I've eaten out of that garden tastes better than what it does in, in the shops. It tastes a lot more sweeter. But, but for people that say they don't have time or it's too much work, like how, how much time a day do you spend out in the garden, would you say? Well, I spend quite a lot of time in the garden because I just love the peace in the garden. It, so what, like an hour or two Maybe hours? two. Some nights if I'm watering it, it may be about three or four hours. But I do spend a lot of time in the garden. It's my front lawn. As you say, I live in a council flat, so now I've got this outlet. And how many, at this, at this moment, what's growing out there? Um, we have sweet corn, cabbages. Um, we've just dug up potatoes and carrots. Um, just got all the basic herbs still growing out there at the moment. Um, there's currant bushes, gooseberry bushes, raspberry bushes, beans, rhubarb, just everything, <laughs> bits and pieces. And yeah. who's, oh yeah, there you go. Actually, that reminds me, we see compost bins up there. And um, I know one big thing at the very beginning when we established the garden is that I was very keen to Oh, there she is. Um, the, and these, by the way, whenever I come back, I always am uh, visiting and taking pictures. So these were actually just from June. Um, and every time there's more activity and there's more stuff going on. Um, 
but we were very keen on having a compost system there when we first started it, a way for the residents and the council estates to gather their kitchen scraps and make dirt. Um, for, for those of you at the Gardening Marathon who don't know what compost is, which I can't imagine, any, I'm hoping everyone knows what compost is. Um, but there was a lot of resistance to that at the beginning. There was this idea that it would attract rats and, and people were um, not keen on the idea and we didn't do it right away. But then I came back the following year and the compost bins were there. Um, and someone had started a pretty good composting system. Um, have, you, have you gotten a sense from the other residents how they feel about composting? Is that something everyone's doing? Yes, they're always constantly asking us for um, compost buckets. And oh, really? So everyone's doing it? Yeah, and the surrounding estates. Like Even the, the surrounding estates, not yes. just the... Yes. So were they... they come from afar to use our bins. Really? Yeah. So they, they actually bring all their kitchen scraps from their kitchen? They even. do, yes. Oh, that's very surprising, because it was actually the, the most uh, resistance that we had, I think, when we were establishing it at the beginning. Um, but how has the compost been? Do you take care of it? Yeah, we do take care of the compost So what, bins. What, do you, what do you do for that? I will return and put extra water shredding and shredded paper in now. Oh, there she is. You don't have to look at yourself. I know. <laughs> I shouldn't have put that in, sorry. Um, so I think, the, you know, you may have seen that slide up there bec uh, of, uh, towards the end of the presentation. I know I had to put that in. I hope that's not embarrassing. But um, in 2010, the mayor of London, Boris Johnson, announced an edible estates com competition in, in, in part inspired by this garden. Have you you know, a competition for local housing estates to plant gardens like this. Have you noticed among neighbors, among people coming around, asking about it, wanting a garden like that at their own yeah, council I, housing I, estate, or? I did a room, I didn't used to know a lot of people. It's only when this, car, this garden come along that I now speak to everyone. People come past and give me tips and. But are people, so are people wanting you know, for example, what I heard is some of the other council housing estates are now curious about this. Yes, we have a lot of people from other council estates wishing they could have a garden like mine. Yeah. We have been, me and Carol, we do do other um, estates and get them involved with using the land and growing things. I mean, what, there, there is a story in the Edible Estates book by Carol Wright from Bost, who is a... a pivotal figure in getting the garden going and keeping, keeping it going. And I think with all these gardens that I do, there's this fantasy of what it's going to be and this idea that if you make something a dream in your head, a physical reality in the land around you, it will somehow lead to something else. Or, um, I mean, each garden's different. But in this case, there was this idea in my head that if it was there, somehow it would attract, it would, um, it would create a desire for it, something that maybe didn't previously exist. But the interesting thing I've learned from Denise is I think if you hadn't been there, the garden wouldn't continue in a no, way. Because no. I think it required one passionate person to keep it going. And then even if nobody else does it, like I was saying before, it's physically there for people to see. And so even if this dream didn't come true that all of the council housing estate residents are out there gardening, at least it's Denise's gardening, and at least everyone can watch her garden. Yeah. And I think maybe that's um, the most we can hope for sometimes. Do you, do you have anything you want to tell everyone who's curious about growing food in London? Anything that, any advice or um, anything that we haven't talked about? Just keep on doing it. It's the best, it's the best tonic in the world, creating your own garden. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Denise.